Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kircha. Coming up in today's newscast, much to everyone's dismay, the latest polls point to yet another deadlock in the coming March election. Incredibly rare ancient artifacts are on display after years of excavations. And for the first time ever, one international art sensation is headed to Tel Aviv. Well, the Israeli national elections are less than two weeks away, but polls are continuing to predict a deadlock. Israeli Channel 13 has just released a poll showing that the centrist Blue and White Party is increasing its edge over the Prime Minister Netanyahu's Likud Party and would win 36 Knesset seats, while Likud would only win 33. Now, the Joint List Alliance of Arab Parties would claim 14 seats, left-wing Labour Gesher Meretz would claim eight, and the right-wing Yamina Shas and United Toward Judaism would take home seven seats apiece. Now, that means that the overall bloc of religious and right-wing parties supporting Netanyahu would win a total of 54 seats, while the center-left bloc would take claim to 58, which means yet another deadlock. A separate poll, by the way, published by Israel's Walla News, predicted, predicted a similar impasse, barring one or two seats. And as per usual, kingmaker Avigdor Lieberman's right-wing secular, secularist Israel Beitenu party would score eight seats uh, in the television survey, giving him just enough leverage to push either side uh, to about the necessary 61 seats to form a coalition. But here's the thing. Blue and white chairman Benny Gantz has been adamantly stating that his party will not sit in a government with the joint Arab list, which means that that would knock off about 14 seats of the center-left bloc, bringing his total down to 44. Now, the extreme right Otzma Yehudit party isn't predicted to make it past the electoral threshold necessary to gain a seat in the government. But here is an interesting tidbit. Despite predictions that the blue and white party would gain more seats, when asked who's more suited to be prime minister, 45 percent of respondents answered Netanyahu, with only 33 percent supporting Benny Gantz. And that's the biggest discrepancy the channel has recorded in recent months. Well, as we all know, two previous votes failed to break the political deadlock between the blocs led by Netanyahu and Gantz, respectively, and attempts by both leaders to form a unity government together have also failed. And it really doesn't seem like anything is going to change, especially since right-wing and religious parties have just renewed their pledge to back Netanyahu as prime minister on Sunday. In other words, the political stalemate is unlikely to change unless some Knesset members in either bloc break ranks. Now, it's the most egregious leak of personal data in the history of the nation. I'm talking, of course, about what experts are calling the recent publication of millions of Israelis' personal details by a Likud-partnered campaign app. But as if one massive security failure isn't enough, the app has allegedly now gone on to allow two new breaches within just a week of the first. The Likud party's campaign management app, Elector, is added again. Within just a week's time, the developers have leaked the personal data of all voting age Israelis, or all Israelis above 18, twice. And both breaches include names, sex, political orientations, addresses, emails, and more. But what's more is that the second leak was much, much worse. It includes two new sets of data, the first being keys to Elector's Amazon Web Services account, which has Israel's entire voter registry, a list of recruited activists, and SMS messages between them, and the second being Elector's internal source code, including passwords and keys to third-party services. Elector, however, which is used both by Likud and by the Israel Beitenu party, is denying the accusations, saying the data that was stolen was old, not connected to code still in use, and all an attempt to embarrass the company for political reasons. While well, activist hacker and Verizon media developer Ran Barzik, who first discovered these leaks, says that that just isn't honest, explaining that exposed information is exposed information, and that even kindergartners know better than to include passwords in their code. As for Likud and Israel Beitenu, the two both claim that they're making every effort to maintain privacy while working with security firms to solve the mess. Well, on another note, in the aftermath of the, re of the release of President Trump's so-called deal of the century, campaigns both for and against the U.S. peace plan have been heating up. But one ad in particular by the Middle East Forum is now catching the ire of Tel Aviv Mayor Ron Huldai. And here to break it down is Israeli attorney and legal advisor to the Israeli movement for governability and democracy, Simcha Rotman. Now, you are defending the Middle East Forum in this case. Tell us a little bit about it. So basically what happened is that Middle East Forum launched a 
a campaign saying you can only do peace with enemies that you have beaten before. It's a, a, a catchphrase that used to, to be, you do peace with your enemies, they add, play with enemies that, that you, are, you have beaten. And right. you see in the picture, you see um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas and Ismail Ania. They are surrendering, they're putting their hands in the air, they have uh, blindfolded. Uh, uh, blindfolded, and um, and you see uh, devastation around them. Right. That's to say that if you want to do peace, you have to beat your enemies first. This went on billboards last weekend, on Thursday. and um, Across Tel Aviv. Acro all across Tel Aviv. Um, Khuldai, the mayor, he uh, said, I don't like this message. This is not our way. It reminds me of Daesh and the Nazis. Is that what he says? His words, not mine. Mm -hmm. And he ordered the municipality to take it down, to take all the, the billboards down. Um, the Middle East Forum, uh, I appealed in their name to uh, the court on, uh, on, on Motsai Shabbat, on, on, uh, on Sunday on, and on Sunday morning. And uh, we will have a court hearing this weekend. But the idea is, is freedom of speech still a thing in Tel Aviv? Because the, the fact that um, uh, Khuldai uh, mm -hmm. takes down a billboard just because he doesn't like the message, it's not uh, something, he has the authority to take down uh, porn pornography, he has the authority to take down something that it's illegal, right. but the message, but, it's a good question, so why does he do it? Is, it? is it not arguable that that message promotes or incites violence? Um, I think it's in a, in a democratic country, it's legal to promote violence against your enemies. Um, the, I have to remind maybe the audience, the state of Israel just uh, uh, bombed uh, parts of Gaza um, and, 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 Ismail, and Ismail and Nia soldiers. And are not the and, same person. And Ismail and Nia yeah. soldiers. Israel um, um, said that Abbas is funding terrorists. Um, but and there's also still the U.S. security cooperation also, with so, Abbas. There's, I mean, so these we have are we have a complicated relationship, and the idea is that Middle East Forum trying to push forward is that the, the relationship should be one that when there is a clear victor and a clear someone who lost. That's the idea. You don't have to agree. Basically, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure what I think about this message. I never stop to think. What I really think is that freedom of speech is not for messages that you like, I like, or some other people like, and definitely not the mayor. The mayor Mayor does not have to approve signs right. uh, and politically. But you know, I just going back to this issue of incitement. You know, you look at this sign; it, it invokes blood, uh, war, disaster. That that's the image that you see there. Yeah. And the uh, question uh, is, if young kids who are walking around in Tel Aviv should be looking at that sign, um, right? Any more so than they it, would have pornography um, and the other things that you that's, said. That's, that's, an, that's an argument that can work about gay parades. That's an argument that can go against, against billboards with with uh, um, some... some but, but you would say that this is a sign that is not promoting violence? Because I, am, I am saying that it's a sign that's promoting victory over our enemies. Okay. In a democratic country, it's a legitimate message. It's a, again, Israel is using legal violence in Gaza, right as we speak, we bomb Gaza. We bomb in Syria, right? For according to yeah. to, to some other uh, news outlets. Well, so, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out because obviously uh, it's controversial. A lot of people have a lot of different. It's controversial, about but this. freedom of speech is for controversial messages. That's what the Supreme Court of Israel said time and again about the municipality authority to take down billboards. All right. And I hope we'll hear the same this weekend. Okay. Thank you so much thank for you joining so much. us. Thank all right, now fear of the coronavirus spreading is practically tangible as the death toll has risen uh, by 98 overnight across mainland China. The total deaths number at least uh, over 1,800 and confirmed cases are up to more than 72,000 with no end in sight. Israel, of course, is doing everything possible to cut off the pandemic's path here in the, in the Jewish state. The borders are closing. What started as a stern travel warning is now a full-blown ban on all non-Israelis who have visited four problematic East Asian countries in the past 14 days. Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Macau. And all Israelis who have even been to these nations recently must also submit to home isolation, regardless of whether they're symptomatic. The new directives come at the hands of Health Minister Yaakov Litzman and Interior Minister Arya Deri. Now back in Israel with dozens in home isolation, another interesting problem has arisen. Israel's third consecutive 
consecutive national election is now just 13 days away. But isolation lasts at least 14 days. So to make sure as many Israelis as possible can cast their ballot on March 2nd, special voting booths will be established. Among other locations, they'll be built inside hospitals and medical centers. And at these booths, observers will wear protective equipment to defend against voters suspected of having the disease. Super, super, super it's frightening. Terrifying, we especially talk about this. with uh, Health Minister Litzman saying that it's just a matter of time until the disease makes its way to Israel. These are scary times. But in other news, let's take a step back now towards the United States, where Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders is now trying to court the Jewish vote in a brand new campaign advertisement. If Bernie Sanders is elected, he would be our first Jewish American president. As a Jewish American, that would be a huge step forward in this country and blow back against the rise of anti-Semitism in this country. In a major 180 turnaround from his 2016 campaign, Vermont Senator and presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders is leaning hard on his Jewish character ahead of the 2020 vote. In this new digital ad, the second now that focuses on his Jewishness, Sanders' camp emphasizes how he'd be proud to be the first Jewish president in United States history. But the video also goes on to blame the rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic hate crimes on the Trump administration, arguing that with Sanders, a Jew in charge, the hate would die back down. Meanwhile, Trump isn't Sanders' only target. In a two-minute clip posted to social media, Sanders takes aim at Democratic rival and former New York mayor Mike Bloomberg, saying his money alone won't create the energy needed to win the presidency. Bloomberg, on the other hand, has already fired back with an attack ad of his own, though. Calling out the so-called Bernie bros and Bernie bots, or online pro-Bernie harassers, Bloomberg's ad puts the blame for extremist actions on the left at Sanders' feet. The video strings together a slew of online hate and threats for other Democratic candidates and their supporters, and it's headlined by Bloomberg's call for you unity amongst the left. And then finally, in a direct jab at Sanders' original post, Bloomberg writes that, in fact, this kind of energy won't get to the White House either. Now, here is a fun question. How much does it cost to rent an apartment in Israel? Well, that number varies enormously based on where you live in the country. And joining us with all the latest numbers is consumer behavior, behavior expert, Dr. Vili Abraham. So what is the average rent in Israel? Everybody wants to know. Well, um, the average is just a bit over 4,000 shekels uh, a month. It's 2.8% year over year in compare, if you compare the fourth quarter of 2019 to 2018. Uh, but Ashkelon had the highest uh, rise in rent. It's 2.8K uh, uh, per month. And in Tel Aviv, it's 5,700 shekels a month, 34 year over year in comparison to 2019. Just a little bit of a difference. So Tel Aviv, so, I'm assuming, is the, the, the most, most expensive. expensive. And, and what is the least expensive place to live well, in? Well, the least expensive well. place, uh, well, it depends on how many bedrooms you're looking at, because it really varies depending on the- For comparable on properties. For comparable- you know, For comparable, I would say that probably Beersheba is, is in comparison to right. the other big cities in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most dramatic increase is among the two bedroom apartments. Mm -hmm. So in Ramla, it's 2,600 shekels a month, and Jerusalem, Cholon, and Netanya, it's 3,000 shekels. Well, now, well, and just for everybody at home who's watching this, just so you know, a two-bedroom apartment in Israel is considered a one-bedroom apartment in the United States. It's one exactly. bedroom and then a living space. Oh, and and so. it's it's about so 800 or $900 a month, which is pretty expensive. Wow. Uh, if you look at three-bedroom apartments in Jerusalem, it's 4,000 shekels, and Tel Aviv, six, and in Haifa, it's 2,700 It's shekels. interesting how that is the average because, of course, when you think about Tel Aviv specifically, if you want to live truly in the center of the city, forget of about course. it. 6,000 oh, for a three-room three apartment. There's no chance you're going to find something like that. It like depends it. how close it is to the center. It right. depends whether there's public transportation mm -hmm. nearby, kindergarten, schools, uh, shopping centers. But that's yeah. just the average. Of course, it could be seven, eight, and 9,000 shekels if you were in a new building. What's what's second to Tel Aviv? <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm curious about Do we have that figure? Well, yes. After Tel Aviv, we have uh, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Course. Yeah, one of the most expensive <laughs> yeah. countries. Now, by the way, what I wanted to do is I wanted to see whether there's a correlation between the income, the average income of the yeah, population, right, the cost and of, yes, of living here is and very you know there was really no correlation uh, because, for example, in Tel Aviv, the average is 5,700 shekels, mm -hmm. and people earn on average uh, a little bit more than uh, Jerusalem, but th but the rent is a lot cheaper. Or, for example, if you compare Beersheba right. and Jerusalem. 
on average, people, a family earns about 14,000 shekels a month, but there's a major difference in the rent they're paid. Yeah. And what are some of the factors that are contributing to the rising rental prices today? Okay, two major factors. One, one of them is explains the major uh, reason for this increase in Tel Aviv. It's the Airbnb apartments. Yeah. Mm. There are 7,000 Airbnb apartments in Tel Aviv, right. seven Painful. times as much as in New York City. It's incredible. So it means that one of the reasons why apartments are so expensive to rent or buy in Israel is because supply is very low in mm -hmm. comparison to demand. Yeah. We need 47,000 new apartments every year in order to keep up with demand. Right now, there's a shortage of between 50,000 and 100,000. It's unbelievable. All right. Well, thank you for joining us with these new numbers. I'm not sure how they make me feel. I gli like I sad. A little bit sad. <laughs> a little sad. A little bit sad. But Billy, but thank you so much for <laughs> giving us that wonderful taste. Yeah. Thank you so much. Moving on, good things come to those who wait, and that's exactly true for archaeologist excavations, which can often take years and years to finish. But Israeli researchers from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem are now unveiling half a decade of their work at an incredible Canaanite temple from the 12th century BCE. Years of cataloging and sifting through the dust of the Northeast Temple at Tel Lachish has paid off again, with a breathtaking new release of ancient artifacts and discoveries. And among them are two rare bronze smiting gods found inside the temple's inner sanctum. According to the release, the sculptures measure just under 10 centimeters or 4 inches tall, and they were originally adorned by a silver coating. But researchers also believe one of them may have even been worn as a pendant, and that's far from the only find in Tel Lachish. The discoveries described come from excavations between 2013 and 2017, and other ritual items such as bronze cauldrons, jewelry inspired by Egyptian goddess Hathor, decorated daggers and axe heads, scarabs, and even a gold-plated bottle inscribed with the name of Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II have been unearthed. Lead archaeologist on the project, Professor Yosef Garfinkel of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, says that only once every 30 or 40 years do we get the chance to excavate a Canaanite temple like this in Israel. And what we found sheds new light on ancient life in the region. It would be hard to overstate the importance of these findings. All right, now if you're planning a vacation to Israel and are wondering where to stay, no worries. It's time for YVT's Beautiful Faces of Israel segment, which is produced by the incredible Inon El Natan, and we have the scoop on Israel's top hotels. In recent years, Israel hotels can be compared to the best hotels in the world. Therefore, we're going to show you now the most beautiful and unique hotels in Israel. So take a deep breath. Let's get started. Israel Hotel Bereshit Hotel presents luxury in the heart of the desert with an unforgettable hosting experience, fine dining, luxury spa, spacious rooms, a magnificent pool, and of course, a panoramic view of the unparalleled desert landscape. Jerusalem to the most famous hotel in Israel, King David Hotel. The iconic hotel is laden with the luxury and history of hosting world leaders with the finest elegance. Jerusalem situates the Israel Hotel Orient Hotel, which overlooks the ancient walls of ancient times. The hotel's innovative architecture blends perfectly with the city's glorious past. The guests can enjoy the most luxurious and upscale resort experience with personalized service, outdoor rooftop pool, and indoor pool. of Jerusalem, Israel Hotel Premium Spa Hotel is inviting you to a particularly romantic vacation. The hotel is located on a vineyard and pastoral vines and offers a unique and luxurious wine and spa vacation. And if 
we're talking about a romantic vacation, Dream Island Hotel introduces uplifting international experience. 16 acres of luxurious facilities, nature, sports, culinary, spa, lifestyle workshops, summit of good life. Along Israel, there is an amazing seaside strip, Don Acadia Hotel. Nestled on the shoreline, seamlessly step from the pool to the beach and back to relax in the sensational spa, Don Acadia. Style, the Don Caseria Hotel is the hotel for you. Escape the routine and dive into the serene. Amidst acres of luscious gardens sits the new Don Caseria Resort where happiness is around every corner. Thank you for watching. We'll meet in the next chapter. All right, Aaron, I think you might have found a nice romantic destination to go to for the weekend with your wife. Huh? I have a few places in this video that actually look amazing. El Bereshit, for one, like looks spectacular. Yeah, I've been, I, wanting, I've been wanting to go there a long time. For a very long time. But this is actually the first in a bunch of, ho uh, of uh, videos about hotels and places to stay. So stay tuned. And in the meantime, for those of you who want to check out more videos like this about where to travel in the Holy Land, go to www.tbfnews.com and download the app Why Travel. We'll be back next week, of course, with more. All right. Now, the art scene is a huge mm. part of Israeli culture. And from pop-up mm. urban art museums and abandoned apartment buildings to the weekly art market on Nacharat Binyamin in Tel Aviv, there are plenty of chances to see all kinds of creative work. That's true. And as an artist myself, I can personally attest to how yeah. there is seriously so much out there. And I love hearing about all the creative art that Israel has to offer. Feels kind of like it's never ending here, honestly. But That's true. Nittany Manson is here now to give us the rundown on the latest artistic updates. Nittany. Hello. Thanks, guys. First off, we have an Israeli iPhone photographer who is changing the way people view their morning commute. Uh, Dana Fazi from Hadera is, has spent the last decade photographing people on her daily commute to Haifa. And now she's taking home another prize for her creative approach. She actually recently won the first prize for street photography in the ninth annual Mobile Photography Awards, along with another, with another five honorable mentions. Yeah, and these are amazing. I've seen Seriously. Dina's work before. Um, it's, it's just, it's so impressive. I feel like I could take a note or two from her in terms of how to use my own phone, because I'm terrible with taking photos. Yeah, I mean, these, these, these photos just yeah. have such character and, and yeah. beautiful depth. I mean, it's impressive how much you can do, honestly, with like an iPhone, and, yeah. and yeah. you can just take this technology anywhere. Uh, there's never actually really been a better time to, yeah. to be an artist uh, with all Dina. this digital tech. Uh, but still, I've heard that we're actually getting some new exhibits here as well, and I'm very excited. Uh, Nini, why don't you take it from here? Thanks. So that's right. Jeff Koons, mm -hmm. the neo-pop artist and creator of those larger-than-life balloon animal sculptures, will be moving his pieces to Tel Aviv next month. And his exhibit, titled Absolute Value, will be on display in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art starting on March 20th. Um, they're going to be filling up the largest exhibit hall, which is an impressive 850 square meters, wow. and they'll be there until October two, 2020. Yeah, that's much bigger than most Tel Aviv apartments, I'd have to say. I'm definitely going to have to go and Sadly. check it out. What about you, Aaron? I know you're excited. Oh, yeah. He's definitely he's one of my favorite artists. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy that he's coming here. Nini, so, thanks for joining us and giving you. us a scoop. <laughs> my pleasure. All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Mm -hmm. An umbrella will definitely be an essential as tonight should be rainy with a low of 54 or 12 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow you can expect more of the same with more rain and highs of 61 or 16 degrees Celsius. Now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. I'm not quite sure this is real, and I just want to see what's up. Ooh. <laughs> it's real. 
I wish I, wish yeah, I could she, be there she to tell She discovered that was real. Of course, it's everybody real. loves it's that here in Israel. Amazing. Have you Amazing. done that before? I've not. I've not. I think uh, watching other people get sprayed. We have something to try to enough. do in the office tomorrow. Next time. All right. That's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.42 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kirchuk. Thanks for watching.